We woo, as our friend Mystery Sniper would say. Indeed. We woo. We woo. Mystery Sniper, of course, one of the regulars for the TikTok live streams. An OG. One of them original gangsters. You know, we often try to do a cold opening, and uh, we often fail. We just mostly do an intro. Well, you a kind vague of, intro. You, you, well, you, by calling it out, you just ruined our opportunity at another cold opening, so that's... Thanks for that. Wonderful, oppor- wonderful opportunity we had there. Squandered possibilities because of you. Speaking of squandered opportunities and possibilities, Wizards of the Coast. <laughs> Yet another installment it's in their their uh comedy of of tragedies yes uh we'll get in we'll get into the stories obviously later but everyone knows apparently apparently now they have a pattern of the beginning of the year is always going to start like shit and the end of the year is always going to end like shit um so we got that to look forward to now yeah as the yearly cycle of content Ever middle of it's a on. rebuild trying to trying to re re uh connive what they have done up to those points and not the magic the gathering feature connive no not where which you. i believe lets you put a plus one plus one counter and like look at a card and see if it's a land or is that explore uh that is explore connive is draw a card then discard a card and if you put a creature oh, if you discard yeah. a creature card then you can put a plus one yeah. counter on uh the thing that connived mm-hmm yeah, it's, it's one of those those classic features of do a thing and sometimes get a counter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, depending on how the thing plays out. Man, it's been a week. And it's only begin. Well, I mean, it's only it's, it's only it's been, two, it's been two weeks since we last recorded. Yeah, yeah. And the big thing, the big thing that'll be happening, um, Christmas and New Year's are coming up. Yeah, they are. Yeah, it is the it is the holiday season as they call it. I am very unprepared. I have my gifts. Nothing is wrapped. Uh, same. There's also like a couple odds and ends. Like I need to get some lottery tickets for a white elephant thing and put them in a Barbie mug, which by the way, getting some kind of mug, cup, whatever, mm-hmm. pint glass, uh, and then whatever your your budget for a white elephant is, like say it's a $30 budget, you get like a $5 cup or something, buy just $25 in scratch off tickets and then put it in the cup and put a bow on that shit and it is the hottest gift at every white element elephant oh, yeah. i guarantee you oh yeah people it love is... gambling with not their money exactly it's never failed to be the one that is immediately stolen by everyone like right out of the gate oh yeah back so. my, i had an uncle who uh never wasted time on gifts after some point because he could just he knew we all liked scratch offs hey, there you go there you go well of course. <laughs> Welcome to the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast. I am Connor. And I'm Sam. We are not brothers. Well, we are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not bro- I can't. I can't even. I can't even with this. We are the Dungeon Bros, and we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. Yes. And we, not that we've done that, what, 56 times? We haven't. Because we, we changed. Oh, we've done the Duels and Mana Dorks for like five. Yeah. And then we've done, we've the, done the regular r- spiel for like 50. Which, by the way... We're we're getting we're getting up there. Yeah. We've we've had our two year anniversary, which is pretty wild. Um most of them have been shit. <laughs> most of the episodes have been not very good, I would say. It took us a while to find a groove. I think we got a pretty good groove going now. It also helps that at the beginning we did not we only did D and D content. Yeah. Uh we picked up MTG a little over a year ago. Yeah. And uh that has drastically given us more things to talk about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Obviously, the Dungeon Bros po- the sorry, the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast in the Dungeon Bros. Jesus Christ. The Duels and Mana Dorks podcast you can find on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, all of the various platforms for podcast. What are you giggling about from the TikTok live chat? A buddy of mine um, just asked, uh, when are you guys starting to do Lorcana content? <laughs> um, when it becomes relevant. Uh, when, when Lorcana is played more than it's collected. We'll see when that is. Not probably, that we follow that. <laughs> probably never. Uh, you can also follow us on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Discord. We have our Monday Night Magic live streams every Monday night. We are skipping next Monday because it's Christmas Day. It is. The day and of Christmas. I'm going to be with my family, and I will not be live streaming playing Magic the Gathering. You could. I could, but I'm not going to. now. I'm not going to. We recently did a live stream uh we took some jumpstart packs and we shuffled them together and we went through like really, really slow and in detail what we were doing all of our turns 
uh, and trying to help people learn how to play Magic the Gathering. Because we do have a lot of people in our chat that are often like, this is really cool, I don't know what's going on, mm -hmm. but it's neat and I like it. Or I've been trying to learn Magic and I've been and like all this kind of stuff. So uh, we're probably gonna do those more frequently. Um, we don't really have a set schedule for when those are, but you can check it out on Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, last night we did a high power game of Commander with two of our favorite decks, and we souped them up uh, with Proxy Forge proxies, which you can check out in the TikTok shop link if you're watching this live. You can also go to our TikTok and have the our TikTok shop showcase there. He's got some beautiful MTG proxies that you can check out. 30% uh, discount, I believe, is still happening, and. A free soul ring if you put Dungeon Bros in the notes. So that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Not an official sponsor of the podcast, but, you know, it's a commission thing. So we're working with them. Yeah, it's a whole thing. And he sent us a lot of cool shit. So, like, got to shout the man out. You can see it here. We got so much cool. Oh, my God. The the fetch lands and the shock lands. And the, they're great. Anyway. 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 Uh, we do have a sponsor for this podcast. Mm -hmm. An actual sponsor. An actual sponsor. And then... An, actual sponsor i used air quotes I, there the actual sponsor with air quotes is uh the secret liar mtg's newest product the secret liar much like the secret lair they're going to be very over costed and very undervalued uh it's a new initiative from one of the the hasbro higher ups uh christopher penis mm -hmm. uh he's not been, to be confused with chris cox no no chris cox is above reproach obviously this Indeed. is christopher penis that we're talking about uh the secret liar christopher penis um, it is you you pay forty dollars for a set of foil cards that they advertise as a certain thing um, like some really high powerful stuff like you get like a demonic tutor mm. you get like a mana crypt yeah. a jeweled lotus like that kind of stuff all in foil for forty dollars and it's like wow they're finally reprinting things and like prices are gonna go down and it's really great and then they send it out and then they just uh, it's like all this beautiful packaging and it's really great and you open it up and then it's just one of each uh, basic land from uh, Magic Core Set 20. And the uh, the art on it has been a photocopied mm -hmm. piece of paper just taped on with uh, Chris Penis's butthole. Uh, Christopher. His yes, Christopher, Christopher Penis. Christopher butt. Penis's butthole. So like, so not Chris Cox. We're not talking no, about Chris No, no, not Chris Cox. We're talking about Christopher Penis. Christopher Penis goes to the office copier and in classic office fashion, uh, puts it puts his butt onto uh, the photocopier, and mm -hmm. that's the art that they use for the basic lands. Yep. Um, so yeah, be sure to check out the newest Magic release, uh, Secret Liars, uh, a Christopher Penis product. I feel bad for the Instaved guys because the actual sponsor is Instaved. <laughs> Instaved with their deluxe twenty D twenty staff of critical hits. Yes. So we did. Uh, we did a fun little create. I enjoyed making that video. Ultimately, uh, we were we were. We, we weren't great about getting it out in a timely fashion, but it was actually really fun. It's a fun it was a fun video, and uh, the Deluxe D20 staff of Critical Hits is uh, this wonderful little staff that we got here. It's got like a little D20 topper on it. Very cool. The cat loves it. <laughs> She's a big fan. Uh, it was brought to life by nearly 1,000 backers on Kickstarter. Uh, it's got some amazing like Apple quality like packaging into it. Like they put a lot of care and effort into it. Um, you can get a little, it gets, comes with a little wall mount. You can put it on the wall. It looks cool. Everyone's going to be jealous. It's a whole thing. Check out instaved.com. Link in the beacons link in the bio. Uh, this will be the last, until the next episode of the podcast, the link will be there. But beyond that, it will not. And you'll have to go to instaved.com for that. Sam? Yes. What have you been playing in the last two weeks? So, recently picked up some Demon Souls on the PS5. Which uh, oh. makes sense because you know I'm a big Dark Souls fan, um, but uh, recently in my group's D and D game, which is a Star Wars Fifth Edition, uh, which is a uh, free homebrewed basically Star Wars skin and then some onto D and D. Uh, recently got to introduce a new character. My character got unfortunately killed. Uh, the DM, our friend Salem, did bring my character back because they felt bad about how un how how misfortunately like, things just went unceremonious end yeah pretty much yeah um it was and uh and i was like you know i'm i'm here's some we could how do you feel about that like it was an unceremonious end but the character was dead i was fine with leaving it yeah but everybody else in the group was kind of like well how can we bring him back and it's like none of you have the correct like i was playing a construct it's like none of you have the correct revivification for that yeah and so i was like 
Got one of them droids. Got one of them droids. But anyway, so I was like, you know what? I'm done with this character. It doesn't quite fit what's going on. So I'm going to introduce a new character. Mm -hmm. And and Salem's like, okay. Cool. We set it up. We set it up. Um, And like I said, it's Star Wars. And I'm like, I'm going to play a Mandalorian. Uh, For those of you who are familiar with the Mandalorians from The Mandalorian, as well as things like Boba Fett. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, the book of the, I hear that was a terrible show. No, it wasn't. It was a good. It was a good concept. It was not well executed. A lot of it. Anyway, that's not the point. Uh, if you, if any of you are familiar with the the comedy, the comedian, the Canadian comedian, you're the Canadian comedy show Letterkenny. Sure. There's a spinoff called Shorzy, mm-hmm. in which a vulgar uh, hockey player goes and does hockey things. Yeah. Yeah. Not to be confused with um, that bit. What is it? Big D and D energy Strazzi. Strazzi, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Similar concept. Um, and we introduced the character, and I started doing. I love that guy, by the way. Oh, he's great. <laughs> I met him once randomly on a live stream that I did with the the um, role playing degenerates. Oh yeah. When we did that fundraiser thing for um, for Papa Likens friends. That's right. Anyway, but. Uh, yeah, so I was I was doing kind of trying to do that the accent that uh, Jared Kiso does for when he's playing Shorzy, which is a little high. It's a it's a that Canadian. Fuck you, Shorzy. For what? For what? <laughs> uh, but yeah, that kind of that northern accent with the high pitch shrill in there. And afterwards, my group looks at me and they go, "Was that a was that a, uh, a Minnesotan accent?" And I said. I'm going for Canadian, and they're like, oh, yeah, like, you're trying to do Shorzy, right? I'm like, yeah, he's the Manda Shorzyan. The Manda Shorzyan. Mm-hmm. At which point, everybody groaned, and my one friend reached for a bottle of whiskey. Wow. <laughs> wow. And I am that's, overly proud of that. That's that's a little fucky, but okay. Um, What have you been playing recently? Well... Not a whole heck of a lot. Obviously, I'm still uh, Minecraft addled. Uh, that's what I. That's what I do in my free time at work. <laughs> yeah. Um, ben, I got. I, I ordered some uh, the Proxy Forge Lord of the Nazgul pack because I want to finish my Lord of the Nazgul deck. Finally, I have the Nazgul cards, and I thought I ordered Lord of the Nazgul, but it hasn't arrived in the mail yet. So I don't know if I actually did or mm. if it's just taking a long time. Uh, but that deck is like almost ready to be completed, and I want to finish that one up. Uh, Auger Axonil finished it recently. I think we talked about it in the last podcast. Maybe not, or I was finishing it. Yeah, uh, I think you were finishing it because then I think we played it. You played it on Friday, yeah, that Friday. Yeah. Uh, 100% win rate, that deck. <laughs> Time to retire it. Time to retire it. Uh, Lathral Blade of the Elves. I also need to just put some lands into it and call mm-hmm. it good. Uh, those are really fun. I'm excited for that. I've been playing uh, Final Fantasy 16 again. That's right, they came out with some DLC, right? Yes, yes. So they announced at the Game Awards that they had uh, two rounds of DLC that they were going to do. One was out immediately, which, by the way, fucking love when game companies do that. Love when any company does that. Like, here's a really cool thing. Also, you can get it right now. Yeah. Big fan of that. Or even, like, when uh, I think it was Fallout 4, Fallout 3, one of those, where they announced it, and then it was out, like, two months later. Yeah. Big fan of that. Big fan of that behavior. I love one of my beloved game series of all time, Kingdom Hearts. Uh, they need to take some fucking notes because Kingdom Hearts 3 was announced in like 2014, 2013, something like that. Uh, came out in 2019. So, and also they basically spoiled like every interesting thing that happened in the game for the most part in trailers in the years leading up because they announced it so early and they felt the need to show it off a lot. Yeah. Anyway, don't do that. Don't do that. Anyway, uh, Final Fantasy 16, uh, Lords of the Fallen, or Echoes of the Fallen, there we go, is the is the DLC. It's like a little uh, end of the game, little post-game DLC. Mm. Um, effectively, they used it as the opportunity to like make the, co- like, make the version of the combat that they wanted to make. Mm. Um, because the, the combat in Final Fantasy 16, it's no secret, it's fairly easy. Even on the hardest difficulty, it's fairly simple. Yeah. Um, because you're given such a breadth of abilities that you can choose from and customize however you want and combine them in any ways that you want. It's actually really deep. It's just they don't really offer any sort of challenge mm. beyond like a couple of end game like super bosses that are optional. Yeah. Uh, and even then, like the most difficult one was like this dragon, like this massive dragon that you fight as like a hunt. 
at the end of the, that you can do at the end of the game and like I cleared it on my third try. Yeah. Jester. The cat is committing sins. Um and like it was fine. Like it was a it was a challenging fight. It was an engaging fight. I loved the game. I 100 percented it. Uh, almost <laughs> didn't get the platinum trophy because I didn't do the the chronoliths. But uh, the Echoes of the Fallen DLC, you get like another fallen ruin, and you get some newer lore about the fallen ruins, uh, and then you get a, a series of like very challenging. Um, mob and boss fights mm. that like actually are pushing you to use your abilities in new ways. You get some new equipment, a little bit extra story. It's all all good. Uh, now I've started playing a new game pl- new game plus playthrough on the mm. Final Fantasy difficulty to kind of uh, get another playthrough in because I really loved that game. And then uh, I'm gonna take my time with it. I'm not gonna rush through like I did when it came out because I was so excited for it. I'm gonna take my time with it. Uh, clean up some of the trophies. And then in the spring is when they're going to have uh, the second DLC pack, which is going to be like an entire new area. And you encounter one of the new uh, one of the icons that was talked about but never shown in the game, Leviathan. And that one looks like the more like uh, wider, more uh, in-depth mm. DLC that I'm quite excited for. So nice. that's what I've been doing. That's what I've been doing. Anyway, uh, as as we do with every podcast we want to go over the upcoming releases from wizards of the coast even though um a lot of people probably don't want to buy their products right now we'll get it we'll get into the, all the layoffs don't you worry um from magic from sorry dungeons and dragons the book of many things uh is out digitally right now uh the physical release was delayed several times with the current release date of january 4th 2024 we'll see how that goes we'll probably know by the end of by uh, the next podcast That's true. if that actually releases uh vecna eve of ruin uh sometime in 2024 and then quests from the infinite staircase in 2024 vecna eve of ruin is going to be like a level 20 like up to level 20 campaign and it like I think it's the first time they've published like a level twenty, a two level twenty yeah. campaign like ever, uh, and then Quest from the Infinite Staircase is another adventure anthology, and those books tend to be pretty good. Uh, from Magic the Gathering, we have Ravnica Remastered coming out next month on January twelfth on my birthday, February 9th, We get Murder at Karloff Manor, Fallout decks, uh, the Commander decks from the Fallout Universes Beyond March eighth, Outlaws of Thunder Junction and Modern Horizons three in quarter two at some point, Assassin's Creed Universes Beyond in July of twenty twenty four, and then in quarter three we get Bloomboro and quarter four we get Duskmorn. What set are you most excited for, Sam? Um, so I know this is a little I don't want to say controversial, but I've seen a lot of people. Uh, poo poo it. Uh, the Thunder, the Outlaws of Thunder Junction, which looks like it's going to be sort of a an American West gunslinger style set. Oh yeah, and That'll I be think good. I think that's really cool. Uh, I had again, I've heard a lot of people be like, "Oh, it's another, it's like a joke, um, a joke plane or whatever." Or like, "Oh, they're not going to take it." Uh, but honestly, Murder at Karloff Manor seems like it'll be more of a joke than I am than the so Outlaws excited for Murder at Karloff Manor. Don't and get me wrong, I think it'll be cool. But. Not just because it's on my birthday. Honestly, Ravnica Remastered looks great. Oh yeah, Ravnica, a lot of a lot of great cards mm-hmm. uh, being reprinted. I'm excited for prices to go down with Modern Horizons three. Um, I'm probably mostly like of, of all of the sets that they that we know of for 2024. For one, that's too many. Two, uh, probably Bloomberg or Duskmorn, just because it's something new. And it's That's not, fair. and at least with Outlaws of Thunder Junction and Murder at Karloff Manor, those are a little bit weird. Yeah. They're like story based things, kind they're, of. They're a twist on the normal magic story that magic tells. Because usually yeah. it tells some sort of fantasy, or if we go to uh, 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 Kamigawa, yeah. you get a, a more um, uh, Japanese like inspired, a feudal. A feudal um, yeah. But yeah. Also, all kind of vaguely futuristic. Anyway. With the renewal set, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, with uh, at this point, the thing that everybody probably wants us to talk about, uh, Hasbro has made some announcements. Uh, we this this is a rare occasion where the Dungeon Bros have gone out Spoken. and made a TikTok about something that we think is bullshit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is absolutely bullshit. Everybody everybody is really lasered in on. So anyway. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let, let's up. introduce the story. Putting putting the cart before the horse. The horse, yes. Putting the cart before the cocks. The Chris Ooh, Cox. Christopher Penis. Uh, Hasbro 
has directed Wizards of the Coast to lay off 1,100 employees. And that announcement came two weeks before Christmas with a large swath of them being laid off immediately. Uh, and then other layoffs to come in the coming weeks and months. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, there is an update to this article that we're, we're, we're by the way, dicebreaker.com highly, highly recommend very good news source here, but they have an update to, uh, this article saying Hasbro representative responded to a, to Dicebreaker with a copy of CEO Chris Cox memo adding quote we are not sharing breakdowns on geography or teams out of respect for employees that is the only uh, that is the only comment they have given mm -hmm. so that's great anyway Corporate owner of Wizards of the Coast, maker of Dungeons and & Dragons and Magic the Gathering, will lay off 1,100 employees two weeks before Christmas. Hasbro announced the decision on December 11th, citing continued, quote, headwinds in the toy and games market, cut into even more conservative earnings estimates. First reported by the Wall Street Journal, Hasbro CEO Chris Cox disclosed the company's plans to axe one-fifth of its roughly 6,400 employees via an internal memo to staff inside a regulatory filing. Inside a regulatory filing, Hasbro is best known for classic children's toys and board games, Play-Doh, Monopoly, chief among them, along with entertainment properties such as Transformers and Peppa Pig. Hasbro already reduced its workforce by 800 people in January of this year, a plan that was supposed to save 300 million annually by 2025, according to the Associated Press. At the time. Chris Cox trumpeted the company's new tact, focus on fewer, larger brands, digital development, and invest hard on direct-to-consumer and licensed deals. Hello, Baldur's Gate 3. He also championed Wizards of the Coast's gaming segment as a continued breadwinner amongst toy lines that couldn't stop flagging in a post-pandemic, that couldn't that couldn't stop flagging in a, po a flagging, oh, that does not make any sense. They're not doing as well in a post-pandemic economy. <laughs> Chris Cox says, quote, headwinds we saw through the first nine months of the year have continued into the holidays are likely to persist into 2024. While we're confident in the future of Hasbro, the current environment demands that we do more, even if these choices are some of the hardest we have to make. Chris Cox said in an email to staff published by the Wall Street Journal, I know this news is especially difficult during the holiday season. There is no sugarcoating how hard this is, particularly for the employees directly affected. The rest of the memo characterized a massive number of layoffs as a, quote, last resort and a lever we must pull to keep Hasbro healthy. Chris Cox first stepped into the role as Hasbro CEO in February of 2022, has a current salary of $1.5 million and has received $9.4 million in total compensation last year. Affected employees will be notified over the course of the next six months. Uh, Hasbro plans to vacate its entire uh, Providence, Rhode Island office when the lease ends in January of 2024. Chris Cox noted the company was not using it, quote, to its fullest capacity, echoing a growing grumble among executives who are pushing remote and hybrid workers back into expensive urban offices to justify their real estate investments. So we have some names of people at Wizards of the Coast who have been laid off. Game designer Dan Dillon came to D&D 5th edition from Kobold Press five years ago. He tweeted, well, today was my last day at Wizards. Not sure what's next. Senior developmental editor Eaton Bernstein also lost his job. Bernstein contributed to several major physical books in D&D's catalog, including the upcoming Quest from the Infinite Staircase and Vecna Eve of Evil. With Vecna Eve of Evil, he was the lead editor. Mm. A book that is not out yet. Nope. Director of Studio Operations for D&D Digital, Wendy Despain, and D&D Beyond producer ho and host, Amy Dallin, confirmed that they were also laid off. Wizards of the Coast Community Manager, Latia Jaquise, who is still employed by Hasbro at this time, said they were, quote, losing the heart of their stream team, end quote. D&D's recently launched Fast Channel, larger relies on contracted workers, and the tabletop RPGs related live streams might soon follow suit. We, I'm have a comment on that later. I'm going to get through the rest of this. Layoffs stretched all the way to the top of the departments in C-suite positions in some cases as well. Michelle Kelly, vice president of global publishing at Hasbro, has ended his nearly 18 years with the company. And Larry Firm was cut from his role as senior communications manager for all of Wizards of the Coast's products. 
One of the strangest losses, Megan Galbraith Donahue, who directed Magic the Gathering's Universes Beyond creative and production teams. Universes Beyond has led to some of the most profitable and most successful ventures for the trading card game Magic the Gathering, including my beloved Lord of the Rings set that came out, Tales of Middle-Earth, which sold fantastically, Doctor Who Commander decks, the upcoming Fallout Commander decks, Final Fantasy VII, and the recently announced Marvel Cinematic Universe crossover. Galbraith Donahue attributed her layoff to, quote, the roll of the dice on a LinkedIn post, but also inferred that she did not see it coming. Director of Game Design's Mark Mike Merles was also reportedly caught in the layoff. Co-leader of the team that created D&D 5th Edition and contemporary mechanical foundations for the tabletop RPG, Merles lost plenty of goodwill with players and the public during his later years with the company. But you cannot deny his impact on D&D 5th Edition and RPGs as a whole. <sighs> so, D&D is, is about to release one of its biggest updates mm -hmm. with the 2024 Player's Handbook. Magic the Gathering is going through a lot of major changes with the oversaturation of products. They've said that they want to release fewer higher quality products, kind of, and they're helping that a little bit with the introduction of the play booster as opposed to the set booster, draft booster, and like all the different booster types. They're just combining most of them into the play booster and then the collector booster as well for their premium product. <sighs> What's clear, many workers will spend the holidays and 2024's first breaths wondering why executive salaries and additional compensation were not instead used as the, quote, last resort, as Chris Cox had said. So, one quick note, because I do want to put this out there. When it comes to uh, higher-level executives and C-suite positions, uh, those are contract-based, and they might not legally be allowed to take less. We don't know because we don't know what those contracts are. So, like, Chris Cox's salary of $1.5 that might not be a negotiable thing mm. until his contract ex is up. Uh, total compensation of nine point four million. I can imagine a lot of that can go away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, will let's say let's say he removed six million dollars and his total compensation was only three point four. Is six million dollars going to save Hasbro and stop them from laying off a bunch of people? No. no especially when they're projected for laying off eight hundred people for over the next over two years was three hundred million. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chris Cox's salary and compensation is a drop in the bucket compared to the money that they are apparently needing to save. Yeah, this is, I mean, we, D&D &D and MT, we, we're obviously invested in this. Like, if Coke announced that they were doing this, we'd be like, ah, sure, Coca-Cola, big company, they probably got to lay off some people eventually. Yeah, they're going to be um, fine. But this is an interesting one because it both infiltrates into uh, the, you know, how businesses run, but also... The fact that it's a creative endeavor overall. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, this is a lot of the way that just companies work. Mm -hmm. So our post that we made on TikTok, because we've not really commented on it. We didn't We didn't really publicly comment on the OGL beyond our podcast. Mm -hmm. Like, if, if people want to hear what we have to say, then they probably already listened to our podcast. Uh, or they might not know about it, which is why we're trying to do podcast shorts. This might be a short. You might be watching this as a short later. Look at you. Look at you. Good job. Thank you. Love the... <sighs> this doesn't make sense mm -hmm. if you're Hasbro. If they're trying to save money, for one, cutting the Rhode Island office when people aren't going back to work, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Sell off your real estate. Yeah. Yeah. Stop absolutely. investing in it. Sell it off. Absolutely. Their product lines, Play-Doh, Monopoly, Power Rangers, Transformers, Peppa Pig, like, those initiatives are not what's making them money. No. They're costing them money. Wizards of the Coast products, D&D &D and Magic the Gathering, are the breadwinners for Hasbro. Yeah, we reported on almost two years ago, I think, uh, Magic the Gathering became Hasbro's first billion dollar asset yeah and part of that was well, part of it was pandemic and people had money to spend but they saw a 
a wild uh, gross income or gross profit uh, uh, where they were projecting we're going to do X. I think it was like 500% of X. Mm -hmm. And so they decided over the next – and they did it in three years instead of five. And so they they decided to instead go for another however much percentage in a shorter amount of time. Mm -hmm. Um, If you want to listen to some early Dungeon Bros content, go check that out. We talked about it. And now we're seeing, and and we talked about it back then, like the market isn't just going to continue to go up. It can't. It, that's not. It, it's, it's not physically possible. It isn't possible. And that and there's been a ton of companies that have made that those mistakes in these post pandemic years of thinking that that growth is just going to continue when it was very clear that it wasn't. It was very clear that it wasn't. And when it comes to Wizards of the Coast specifically, I think. That these layoffs are going to, I hope that for the community, these put into perspective something that I think has been lost on a lot of people. And we talked about this in our TikTok video. A lot of the problems that you look at and a lot of the questionable decisions that Wizards of the Coast has been making with their products and releases. We're going to be talking later about the absolute failure that was the campaign case. Oh, yeah. Uh, We're going to talk about... It's look at oversaturation of Magic the Gathering products. Products like March of the Machines Aftermath, Mm -hmm. where they think, oh, we're going to sell packs that only have five cards instead of 12 to 15, and we're going to sell them at the same price, and people are going to be fine with that. And they weren't. That product sold so horribly that we managed to pick up an entire booster box of that and open all of it up because the booster box was $40. Yeah, down from... Down by over half its price. More than over half. Like, they were selling them probably for a loss. And they, I mean, they do obviously record statistics on their sales and stuff. Mm-hmm. And and it was announced that that was their worst selling booster box basically ever. Basically ever. You know what? Fuck it. I'm going to, we're going to drop down to the wrap up later. The Dungeons & Dragons campaign case. From a Twitter user, Instructaboy, we've talked about him before because he's leaked uh, OGL stuff in the past. Yeah. Um, got a tip off during the OGL situation that WotC had a warehouse full of overstocked product. Campaign cases originally released at an MSRP of 50 to $60. The campaign cases, uh, the terrain and the monster cases, the monster cases were just little plastic circles and then stickers that you put on them so you can use them as marker for monsters on a mm-hmm. D&D table. Perfectly fine product. Yeah, absolutely. Not a 50 to $60 product. No. The campaign case, a similar thing for the terrain where you can, a, a lot of like battle maps, if you buy a, a tube of battle maps on Amazon, a lot of them have like a roll of little like reusable stickers. Yeah. So you can lay down like a campfire or like a table or chairs or whatever on your and stick it onto your battle mat. That's basically what the terrain case is. Mm-hmm. These products, when they were announced at the D&D Direct in 2023, uh, MSRP, 50 to $60. You can currently buy them right now on Amazon for $20. And then Instructaboy retweeted a post from December 11th from uh, John A. Douglas. Ollie's, the uh, big box, a big box like warehouse outlet, basically, yeah. selling the D&D terrain cases for $3 a piece. And here's the thing. Not to toot our own horn, but we called this when we saw this coming out. No and one was going to buy it. The price point was too high. And here's the thing. Uh, you, you, it's not like it's a unique product. No. Like you said, you can if you buy a, buy a battle mat roll, you might incidentally get some of this stuff anyway. Yeah. Or if you go on Etsy or if you go on any uh, – or you could make this probably on your, uh, with, a, with $20 and some uh, JPEGs down at the, your local and staples. You, and you can customize it and get it exactly how you want, and then you can make the quality higher. Mm-hmm. For the same or less cost. Now, if you're going to buy it for $3 a pop at Ollie, not a bad deal. For $3? Have at it. <laughs> for $3 a piece at Ollie or a big de- uh, discount outlet store, have at it. I'm sure that's a steal. That's the reason we got an Aftermath booster box is because you could get it for $40. For $20 each, we got like a lot of cards. Now, I ended up a little bit better on the financials just because of the polls that we got, but... It was also for That's con- also gambling. It was and, also and, gambling and, and for content. Yes. And it was $40. So that's like the price of 
one and a half pre-release kits. Yeah. It's like dinner if I get two beers. <laughs> that is also true. That is also true. That's sad. But let's look back at some of the, the products and the decisions that have been made by Wizards of the Coast this last year. Mm -hmm. The OGL. Oh, we want to profit off of third-party content. Does that sound like something that Jeremy Crawford wants? No. That doesn't sound like something Jeremy Crawford wants. That doesn't sound like something Wizards of the Coast would want to do because they get it. Yeah. You know who would want to do that? Chris Cox. Chris Cax. Christopher Penis would want to do that. Yeah. He would want to profit off of people using his IP. What, let, let's think. The campaign cases, great example. What about what about D and D next? Oh yeah. What about what about the television station? Does that sound like something Wizards of the Coast would want to do? No. They made a cooking show. That's not Wizards. No. Look at look at Magic the Gathering. Gavin Verhey doesn't want aftermath boosters. Gavin Verhey doesn't want secret lairs coming out in such frequency that you're getting more than one a week effectively that the that you can get these beautiful lord of, the beautiful lord of the rings secret lair that had art from the the 80s cartoon movie mm -hmm. the value of the cards printed was like seven dollars they did seven dollars worth of value in cards they didn't even use that as an opportunity to reprint cards from the lord of the rings set that were more valuable or more powerful or more useful and they sold it for Thirty dollars in non foil, forty dollars in foil. I mean, we could even go back to the thirtieth anniversary. Like, if you're looking at those, yeah. If you're, if you are, if you are somebody who plays Magic the Gathering, which we got to assume, basically everybody on the Magic Gathering design teams and and such do, uh, you would look at it and go, oh, I know why 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 uh, Black Lotus is three thousand dollars for a damaged one. Uh, yeah, it'd be stupid to reprint them as just proxies and try to sell them for two. No, that's when you get executives in the in the mix. That's mm -hmm. when you get high people who go, hey, I've looked online or I've seen stories of how somebody uh, sp spent a lot of money on this thing. This thing must be great. Yeah, it must be great. We should re – oh, but we can't we can't destroy the design structure. Oh, it's fine. Just make them not tournament legal and we'll sell the – and because they're so expensive, we'll sell uh, four packs for $1,000. Yeah. What? For $1,000 for proxies? A thousand dollars, and you're not even guaranteed the cards. Yeah, that was a fucking disaster. Gavin Verhey wouldn't have made that product. None of the Magic Design team would have made that product. Do you think the Magic Design team wants to put artists under such a crunch that they're starting to use AI art mm -hmm. to just to meet deadlines? No, it's because they're being forced to make more products. Because Wizards of the Coast is being forced to prop up Hasbro. Hasbro's a failing company. That's why two years ago we talked about Alta Fox, a, uh, mm -hmm. a watchdog group that wanted that tried to get uh, some power in the board to and convince them to spin off Wizards of the Coast, making it its own entity. Yeah, because Wizard Wizards is successful, and if Wizards was on their own, they'd be way more successful than they are now. They wouldn't be having controversies every other podcast that we release once a month or more. Yeah, like. A lot of people are upset with Wizards of the Coast and being like, they just keep fucking up. Wizards of the Coast, I am thoroughly convinced, after this year in particular, I, w I was all on the board of what the fuck is Wizards doing mm -hmm. with the OGL? What the fuck is Wizards doing? What the fuck is Wizards doing? Wizards is being, is doing as they're told. And they can't say no. Yeah. When you're, when you're in a, when, when the people who are your, Effectively, parents. When the parent company looks down at you and says you're doing this, like that's the. No matter if you're the CEO of Wizard, that guy's ahead of uh, over your yeah. head. If you say no and you don't do it, then you lose your job, and they put someone else in who will do what this what is told. That does not mean that Wizards is above reproach by any means. Wizards makes mistakes. I would say the AI art thing is probably a little bit on them for not catching that stuff. The the Hadozi situation with the with spell jammers that's it's their fault. That's they didn't on them. They yeah. didn't catch that shit. That's on them. They're not the ones that are wanting to make these horrible products and make these horrible decisions. Yeah. I I would be shocked if 
everyone that was working above like Jeremy Crawford, Gavin Verhees level designers at the, like those are like the top guys for the design teams of D and D and Magic. If everyone above them is like, oh yeah, let's totally let's totally make a fucking TV station. Oh, let's totally let's totally just oversaturate secret layers and remove any value or reason from them. Oh, let's totally make fucking epilogue boosters that are five cards and sell them for seven dollars. You know what's great about the TV station in particular is we see this after they sold off their production company, their yeah. their their indie production company uh, E1. Yeah, last we- this year. And the D and D movie did great, and people want a sequel. Oh, like, yeah. I mean, Chris Chris Pine has uh, hinted at there might be another one. There might like they're making such terrible decisions from an executive level at Hasbro, and because a lot of people don't realize that Wizards of the Coast is owned by Hasbro. Mm-hmm. I know people that don't really know much about D and D and Magic, mm-hmm. but they're hearing about this shit. And they're like, wow, I can't believe the company that makes D, like D&D is firing 1,100 employees. They're not. They're having a layoffs. 800 employees that are from a different sector of Hasbro are being laid off because they're closing down an entire branch in Providence, Rhode Island. Yep. This is Hasbro's doing. It bothers me that people are so willing to dogpile onto Wizards, and sometimes rightfully so. Yeah, we're not we're not saying they're perfect. We're not saying they're, they're above reproach. They're not above reproach at all. They're com- they're still a company. They're still they're still a corporation and they want your money. But I would much more trust the Wizards of the Coast executives to give us products and services and do what's in the best interest of their customers than Hasbro. Mm-hmm. If Wizards left Hasbro, Hasbro Hasbro would be bankrupt in two years. Hasbro would not be as a uh... Chris Cox is trying to do keep them healthy. No. Wizards is keeping Hasbro healthy. Wizards is Wizards is the healthy body and Hasbro's the leech. Mhm. And a lot of people aren't seeing that and a lot of people aren't calling that out and I'm going to fucking shout that from the rooftops because I love D&D. I love Magic the Gathering. And I'm going to be fucking damned if I just sit down and just watch another entity that managed to gobble them up, take them down with them. You know, it's it's one of those things where uh, D&D kind of disappeared for, what, a decade and a half? Back in, in the uh, 90s, it was a little bit there. But then 2014, when Wizards got a hold of it and made 5th edition. Yeah. We might see that again in our lifetime. Who knows? If Peppa Pig keeps drinking up that uh, that Magic the Gathering money, we'll see what happens. Oh, you, Peppa, Peppa Pig's like a six foot five monster. Yeah, Peppa Pig suckling at the teat of Magic the Gathering. <laughs> Can that be the episode name now? <laughs> no, this is a serious topic. We can't name it something funny like that. But that's fucking hilarious. That's great. Peppa Pig suckling at the teat of Magic the Gathering. <laughs> Should we? Should we? Uh, let's. Uh, do let's... you have any? Do you have anything else you want to say? No, no. I think we have we have covered much of it. Um, we'll move on. We have a couple more stories to cover, and then we can uh, we'll answer some questions in the chat. Yeah, the chats. The chat is. I'm sure. I'm sure. Definitely... Well, do they? Well, what what do they have to say? Do they have anything to say that's topical? I want to. I, I want to be better about incorporating things into the podcast. As as it's pertinent and not waiting until the end for everything. Uh, da, 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 I'm looking through. Um, Nate says, as an LGS owner, wizards are killing the community and are slowly pricing people out. Absolutely. Well, we talked about that with the play booster on a recent on a recent podcast. The play booster replacing the draft and the set boosters. I mean, a lot of LGSs were buying draft boxes and then not being able to sell all of them. Because the perception became the set booster was the good booster, mm-hmm. and the draft booster was only if you're playing draft and not as good. So having one booster, I think, is going to help LGS is quite a bit, and we talked about how that's go- that unification is going to help. But yeah, yeah. Um, 
Bangarang MTG says they blew it all when COVID hit and J&J said this is more important and ruined their company. Mm-hmm. Hasbro be like that. Yeah. There, the, a lot of companies are self-destructing in this post-COVID environment because everyone thought for whatever reason that everything was just going to continue on its merry way. <laughs> That's unhinged behavior to think that. Right. I anything else in the chat? Not at the moment. Okay. Let's move. Okay. Let's uh let's we're move on to some happy. News. We're gonna move on to something uplifting. Uh this is unrelated to D D and Magic the Gathering, but uh for it's those of tertiary related. For those of you that are in the know, um MCDM. One of the one of the great figures in the the D D sphere the D D the D content creator sphere i would say yes um released a crowdfunded a crowdfunded rpg the mcdm rpg on backer kit which is basically like kickstarter but kind of more chill as of the recording of this this project has raised as, as an original goal of eight hundred thousand dollars eight hundred thousand dollars and much like the animated series for critical role that goal was met in about 12 hours. Yeah. If that. Currently, it has raised a total of $3.3 million with almost 20,000 backers, and it still has 17 days left on its, on its uh, backer kit campaign. All of the stretch goals for it have been, meet, have been met. So what he is doing is making a fantasy RPG where your character starts at level one, already a hero. Maybe even a locally famous. You might meet in a tavern or start in the middle of, a, of the action. Whether you're a group of local heroes sent to investigate a mysterious, mysterious goings-on in the nearby haunted wood, or famous mercenaries plotting and scheming in a big city, the MCDM RPG makes building adventures and fighting monsters fun. Basically, any adventure or story you're running in your current fantasy RPG, you can do in this game just in a more straightforward and fun way, unburdened by sacred cows from the 1970s. I love that, by the way. That's pretty good. What this game is not. You can absolutely run epic games with heroes exploring dungeons, but this game is not about dungeon crawling. You don't track torches or rations or worry about running out of light. You can plunge heedless of danger into a dark and haunted forest, but the game is not about exploration. Not hex... No hexes to explore. By focusing the, on the core fantasy of epic heroes fighting monsters and tyranny, we think we can deliver a better experience for your friends at your table. So it is a, a fantasy RPG. Uh, he has some sample pages available uh, along with some sample character creation and classes like the tactician. Uh, and ooh, what's Oh, the dwarf. He's got. You got a little. You got the dwarves. Uh, you got the revenants as a as a race option. I don't know if he's calling it races or not. Uh, he shows some example stat blocks as well for boss monsters and more common monsters. Uh, you can, if you back the Kickstarter, you can get uh, PDFs of the heroes and monsters books. He's releasing two of them uh, at higher tiers. You can get the hardcover uh, paper or the paper hardcover versions uh, of those two. And uh, the the lowest level pledge is forty dollars, where you get the PDF of the just the heroes book. At sixty five, you can get the heroes and the uh, monsters PDF. Uh, Seventy dollars, you get the heroes hardcover for one hundred and twenty. You get the limited edition hardcover for one hundred and thirty five. You get the heroes and the monsters hardcover, and then uh, the special limited edition hardcover of the heroes and monsters is two hundred and fifty. But those are sold out. The Ajax edition. Uh, they blew past their stretch goals. Mm-hmm. 1.5 million funded within a day. Uh, they're working on a virtual tabletop integration. Uh, they have a Vassalorian box set, which is like the, the realm that they're creating for this universe. Uh, $2 million blew past that. And those are the only ones. They did have... Um, ooh, what are the pledge levels? So they added a new Ajax edition pledge level, Wave 2, Um so the Ajax edition is like the hardcover books, the digital copies of the books, resin miniatures, a cloth map of Vassaloria, collectible coin, limited edition dice, direct uh, 
the director's screen, as they're calling it. And it's like a very, very fancy special edition version of it. Uh, They limited it originally to 999, and those sold out almost immediately. And now um, they added another 875 in the second wave that sold out immediately. (laughs) And I wouldn't be surprised if they created a third wave for that Ajax edition if they were interested. Uh, You can also back the project for a single dollar to get access to the add-ons. So you can get things like a t-shirt and sticker pack or order one of the PDFs or both of the PDFs or either of the hardcovers or both of the hardcovers or get the limited edition hardcovers as additional add-ons to your pledge amount, uh, which if you were to, for example, get both the Heroes and Monsters hardcovers, if you did the backer level, it'd be $135. If you did, uh, it would also be $135 as an add-on if you went and backed it at any other tier for any other specific product. So you can get multiple things. Um, for one, big fan of the use of backer kit as opposed to Kickstarter. I've, Kickstarter is kind of predatory for a lot of these things. Um, I am both shocked and also not even kind of surprised by the success of this. It's one of those things. So, uh, Matt Colville was basically who I started watching when I wanted to start playing D&D. Uh, he was, I think I started watching when he had maybe four videos out. So, I'm, an, so you know, I'm a little hipster there. No, but uh, I've, I've loved to see how he's, you know, he grew as a content creator and then started his company with a bunch of his friends. And just from there, I mean... Uh, they put out when they put out when they started their first book that they wanted to put out they did again backer kit and the same thing happened where they're like we need this many dollars please if you're interested in this uh throw some money at us and then the same thing happened where it's like oh we got way more money than we were expecting Mm -hmm. um oh i I do want to issue a quick correction uh they they met their goal and got over a million dollars in two hours yeah in two hours, they got a million dollars. Their original goal was eight hundred thousand. Yeah, Matt Colville, you need to re- you need to recognize that like you're the fucking man. Oh, he, oh, he's <laughs> he's put out videos talking about it and being like, this is like you know, I started you know started playing back in back in when I was sixteen and 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 so much has happened since then and that's all led to this moment. He he understands, mm-hmm. but. I do like, really, really like what he does where he says, here's what it is. Here's what it isn't. Yes. I think there are so many, so many, uh, well, I mean, just companies they in try- general just say, here's what it is. Here's what we're giving you. And when it comes to D&D, we always just hear, oh, it's, 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 the, it's the tabletop RPG. It does everything you want it. And, you know, they don't, Wizards doesn't explicitly say that, but that's what it's, it's They're implying. conflated as. They're implying. And in many ways, D&D can do anything that you want it to be. It can do it can many be any, things. It can, it can do many things. It's not a war game. No. And even though it was originally designed with dungeon crawling in mind as a heavy feature, it, fifth edition is when they were moving away from that. Mm-hmm. And so there's some, there's some, there, we talk about a lot of feats that are like, why the, like this feat is terrible it, because it's designed for dungeon crawls. Yeah. But I'm sure the MCDM RPG is going to be wildly successful, wildly popular. Um, I personally plan on backing it. I don't know which tier yet. I'm not a huge fan of PDFs for books. I like having the the books themselves. Um, Sam, do you want to back for... Do you want to do you want to back this campaign at all? Oh yeah, absolutely. I've backed several uh several I've I've backed 3 of their books now. Mm-hmm. And uh like I said, he was one he was my one of my original inspirations for learning how to run the game. So yeah. I'm probably going to do the Heroes hardcover and just uh figure out the monsters on my own. Fair enough, personally. Uh but will this be a D&D killer? I, th- I it I will say the the release timing of this and the layoff announcement, I there's no way that could have been on purpose because nobody knew until it happened. Yeah. But the serendipity of that, I'm sure he is like, fuck yes. Here's the thing. MCDM. Not, not fuck yes that people are losing their jobs. Fuck yes that the timing of it oh, yeah. is benefiting him. I mean, he they, like uh, MCDM, Cobalt Press, um, uh, who does Pathfinder? 
Ooh. Um, I'm, oh my god. I'm I'm blanking. Paizo. 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 Yes, 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 they yes, all yes. kind of announced at the same time, right around this time last year when all the OGL stuff was going down. Hey, we're gonna do our own thing. We're gonna start making. And everybody started predicting then, or started like uh, trying to trying to say, oh, this one will kill D and D. Oh, this one will kill D and D. I think I don't think any of them will kill D and D. I think the thing that will kill D and D is D and D. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, no, D and D is not going to kill D and D. Hasbro's going. Hasbro's going to kill D and D. Hasbro is going to kill D and D. Not to fucking hound on that more, but. Uh, do you have anything more to say about the M- MCDM RPG? Uh, I think it's really cool that he threw up some sample pages. I think that is a very big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, that shows that they're already well in, on, in the way of designing a lot of these things. Uh, you can check it out yourself. You can kind of get a feel for it. Uh, give some rules samples, some stat block samples. Um, w- we would go over it, but there's just too much other things to talk about this week. Yes, we're, we're, we're short on time as we are. Yeah, so uh, that is all we have on that. Lastly, we're going to end it on another, 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 little, another little down. We'll make this a wrap-up. Uh, the wrap-up here. So we already talked about the campaign cases. We mm-hmm. incorporated that earlier. Uh, you can get them for three dollars at all at uh, Ollie's. So if you have an Ollie's near, you can go do that. But uh, there was a big controversy at PAX Unplugged. D and D was showing uh, Wizards of the Coast was showing off some uh, play- 2024 Players Handbook stuff, including some art that includes a uh, a dwarf character that's holding a sword and a shield, and then a bunch of people online started to um, freak the fuck out thinking that it was AI generated. And if you look at some of the things, it's like, I guess the lighting doesn't like match up super well or like, oh, that belt goes to nothing. It's like, this is a fantasy character. A lot of the belts go to, have you watched (laughs) anime? A lot of the belts have gone to nothing. The artist himself, I can't find the tweet, but I saw it. He pulled up like his sketches like his hand drawn, like he took a, a, a picture of a hand drawn sketch and then several layers of his digital drawings to show, like, I drew this. And then DD Beyond released a statement saying, We became aware of community concerns that generative AI was used in an art piece we recently teased. We confirmed with the artist that no generative AI was used, which is consistent with our artist guidelines restricting it. We're happy with the artwork and hope you enjoy it as much as we do. We can't wait to share more with you soon. Obviously, obviously, AI art has been a big point of contention in the in the D&D community. And I think people, people are clued into it now. And now and, they're looking for it. And now they're looking for it. And we... And, I love that we're calling it out and that we're finding things out. I mean, things like uh, even Magic the Gathering with Wayfarer's Bobble. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of want to buy that card just to have because I think that's a cool story. Um, But not everything is generative AI. You you can still... Also, they were pointing out things like the lighting doesn't line up or the... It's like there's like weird... Like there's a weird line or it doesn't make... It's like, yeah, because he probably had a deadline. Like, just because it's a little bit wonky in some of the details or, like, the patterning doesn't match up perfectly. Like, if it matched up perfectly, like a pattern on clothes, that would look more fake to me, personally. Yeah. But I think I think people just, just need to get a little focused. I just wanted to bring that up. Do you have anything to say about it? I feel bad for the artist. I know, right? <laughs> like, like, oh, boy, I got I got commissioned. I'm going to my art's going to be on the D, in front of D&D book. And everybody's like, hey. You're a computer. It's like, no. No. Now I get it. It's, it's good art. It's it, a dwarf. Yeah. He's got a sword and a shield. He looks fine. I like the action scene around him, personally. I think the, the backdrop looks really, really good, and that the action posing and all that is fucking also, great. Also, it has a very different feel than the rest of the, than all of the uh, 2014 edition mm-hmm. books that have been put out. Those mm-hmm. are all very stretched out, and they're kind of like just one layer almost. Yeah. This definitely has has some perspective in it yeah it has it has layered art it actually puts it actually puts the art that we're seeing for uh, this character like in context of what's happening Mm -hmm. because it's like ooh, here's a dark elf and then it's like a dark elf that stood there and holding a sword and it's like ooh, here's the barbarian and it's like the barbarian pose that you all know 
Like, yeah. Anyway, uh, the last thing uh, we're going to bring up, this is a Warhammer 40K thing, not really our realm, but uh, Amazon has inked a deal to produce Warhammer 40K films and television starring the man, the myth, the legend himself, Henry Cavill. Henry Cavill, notoriously amazing person. Henry Cavill, notoriously constantly screwed by the Hollywood system. Yep. Between The Witcher, between um, Superman. Superman. Uh, he's been what he's loves 40K. He has talked about his love of 40K and making armies and playing the games and painting the minis and doing all of that stuff. And uh, Games Workshop signed over the rights to si- series, film, and more. Henry Cavill will produce and star in multiple projects funded by Amazon. Uh, if you want to read about that, you can go check it out on dicebreaker.com. But good for him. Really proud. Uh, your friends had heard uh, some interesting things that might be. This is kind of rumors and speculation. Yeah. Um, I was hanging out with some friends who play 40K, and over the weekend they were saying that um, whoever it was that was supposed to review the the contract over at uh, Games Workshop, who was the producer of uh, Warhammer, botched it and, like, it looks like there's a possibility that uh, they sign. They just basically completely signed over one of the factions to um, Amazon, making it so that more or less the uh, Amazon could start or uh, a Games Workshop would not see uh, royalties or money based on um, some of the content produced. Uh, again, don't know. Didn't read that part. Uh, we also don't really have the deal in front of us to be able to read through ourselves. But if anything interesting comes and we remember, we'll definitely uh, say something about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of my favorite Henry Cavill stories is uh, there's a there's this uh, at a at school. This kid was like they were going through. Oh, what is what does your family member do? Oh, what what does your family were in like in first second grade? And the kid goes, Oh, my uncle is Superman. And the teacher goes, We shouldn't be lying about things like that. Yada yada. And, um, his mom and like, he gets in trouble and his mom like learns about it. And so the next day, uh, she calls her brother and is like, Hey, can you take him to school? And Henry Cavill brings his nephew into school and says, hi, I'm Henry, Henry Cavill. I play Superman. <laughs> He's not lying. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> of course he was doing it in a very delicate British accent. That I love that. I love that very much. All right. Well, that is all that we have to talk about. On this episode of the podcast, of course, you can get the Duels and Manadorks podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, and others. Apparently, apparently, according to the back end of our uh, podcast distributor, Podbean, uh, a good number of people listen on like Alexa. Hey, or Alexa. like or like FM ra- or like uh, XM uh, XM Sirius Radio. No, no, not Sirius. It's like a, I think it, I think it's Alexa FM or something mm. like that. I don't fucking know. Alexa. Play the Dungeon Bros latest podcast. Uh, Alexa, play episode 57 of the Duels and Manadorks podcast. You can also follow us on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Discord. We have our Monday Night Magic live streams where we play Magic the Gathering. We also have... uh... Yeah. (laughs) We do Jumpstart. We play Commander. It's a whole thing. Anyway, Sam... We will end this podcast as we always do with questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the TikTok live chat as we record this podcast every week live on TikTok. Uh, Bangarang MTG. When we were talking about the uh, talking about how uh, Wizards is is pricing out a lot of uh, and and really affecting LGSs, uh, Bangarang MTG also says also a big struggle with arenas pulling people away from pad, uh, paper magic. Yeah, that is true. That um, is true. I mean, that's also I think. I don't know. As people who have played arenas, I can't. It's just not as good as paper. Magic. It's not. It really isn't. And obviously, people are going to be able to play arenas more frequently, more regularly. They don't have to work as hard to actually make it happen. But you you get a lot less out of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and from the perspective of wizards, um, they're going to be making digital versions of the cards anyway in the design process, and then they literally just basically need to drag and drop and then have a programmer program the functionality of the card. Yeah. So Arenas isn't going anywhere, sadly. Um, they also, they're... 
in a lot of ways, they're not supporting arenas super great. So no. they're not really supporting a lot of their things super great. Uh, but yeah, the the move to arenas has definitely negatively affect, uh, affected LGSs. But ultimately, I don't think there's there's any way that arenas is going away or MTG online for that matter. Yeah. Um, Jorge de Dallas Molly says, "Can you explain how work from home?" Uh, you find a company that says you can work from home and you work on a computer all day. Yep. That's what Sam does. It is. Fringe Minority says Cavill is a god. Henry Cavill is a god. He is a god among men. He's an Adonis. Like, have you seen him shirtless in Superman when he had a, when, or it was uh, the Justice League when he had a, like a hairy chest? Yeah. Hairy chest Superman? Hairy chest. Mm, that man. <laughs> that man. Uh, Unique Alien says, what's your favorite class? Ooh, Warlock. Warlock? Yeah. Hmm. Big fan of the Warlock. I like the customizability of it, but it's not too customizable. It's not the Artificer. It's not the Artificer. It's not the Mystic. It's the reason the Mystic went away. I don't know if I have a favorite class. I I want I I like to I like to get I like to run the gambit. You know. Mm-hmm. I'm also a big fan of the Ranger. I like the half casters. Mm-hmm. But I do like a Paladin. Mm-hmm. I think I like the concept of cleric more than a cleric than an actual yeah. cleric. Yeah. We'll see. Maybe uh, clerics are, are getting a decent little change here in in the 2024 edition. So. I think the clerics are going to be like slightly less powerful, but better to play. Yeah. You know. Um. But honestly, I think it comes down to I love a gish. I love uh, swords and spells, swords and sorceries. Give me a blade singer. Mm -hmm. Give me an eldritch knight, paladin, ranger, hexblade warlock. Give me all that shit. Bring it in. Swords bard. Mm. Uh, Fringe Minority says, did you guys play Dragon Strike or just straight to D&D? Straight to D&D. Straight to D&D. Since then, though, uh, I have been branching out a little. I played some other, um, like I said, there's the homebrewed version of the star wars skin uh, i've played some kids on bikes played mm-hmm. some um uh monster of the week maybe going to play some uh, mcdm rpg I, I imagine that we will i imagine that we will uh i've been interested in like uh the cinder hearts oh yeah yeah cinder i like hearts. that i like that uh, very cw Vampire the Masquerade is also yes. another one. I was in, I was I, I wanted to get a game of uh like a learn to play of Vampire the Masquerade in at Gen Con. It just didn't work out. Yeah. Our Gen Con plans didn't go as planned, but next yeah. year we'll be better. We're gonna be better. We're gonna be closer. We're gonna we're gonna keep it more tight in the group that's going with us. Because we went with a bunch of TikTokers, which was great. It was mm-hmm. a fun time, but driving forty minutes to and from the convention hall kind of killed the vibe a lot. Oh yeah. I would rather get someplace closer. And then just invite people over one night and just have a fucking party. I think that would be fun. Or every night. I don't give a shit. All right. Well, um, I need to get back to work. I also need to uh, get this podcast ready because I got a lot of shit to do tonight and tomorrow. Well, so do you have any do you have any final thoughts, Sam? No. Thank you for everybody's hanging out. Yes. uh, Oh, have a very merry Christmas and a happy New Year. We will be seeing you in the New Year. The next episode of the podcast, we're going to do a 2023 recap. Yeah. Of all the things that have happened in Magic and D&D, good God, that'll be depressing. God damn. Good God. God damn. And I will end this episode of the podcast as I like to end all of my game nights. This one isn't listed here, Sam. Oh. This bit isn't listed here. While you're with your, while you're spending time with your families at Christmas, be sure to deflecting swat that Christmas fruitcake. Deflecting Swat is a targeted ability or spell. I said what I said.